analogy is that of music, whereby after seven notes on your type of scale, if you will, the eighth note be begins a new octave. Within your great octave of existence, which we share with you, there are seven octaves or densities. Within each density, there are seven subdensities. Within each subdensity, seven sub subdensities, and so on infinitely. So the interesting point I think about this is it's kind of like a geometry, or if you imagine an eight-sided uh, shape, that's how consciousness flows as it progresses into a, a vertex, a point on that shape. So it's like we have this very mathematical idea to understand why there's a discrete difference in the level of consciousness is how it's separated out in the in the universe. Thank you. Now, this the way it was explained to me, the difference in density had to do first with consciousness. What would occur is that consciousness would evolve for a being and then with their co once they have more of a connection to their co-creative consciousness, then they begin to change matter, create matter around them. So it's um, a lot. A lot of us, you know, I guess we will not. We won't know until it happens when we have the solar event. But um, it very well could be that we are hit with a, just a whole new way of thinking, a, a, a huge consciousness shift. Okay. So there, this is a question about uh, third and fourth density. Um, they wanted a description of the conditions in fourth density, and Ra decided to explain this in terms of both what is fourth density and what is not fourth density, because they ask us to consider that there are no words for positively describing fourth density. It's, it's not very easy for us to understand. We can only explain what it is and explain what it is not and approximate what it is. Uh, beyond fourth density, our ability grows more limited still until we become without words for explaining. They say, that which fourth density is not, it is not of words unless chosen. It is not of heavy chemical vehicles for body complex activities. It is not of disharmony within the self. It is not of disharmony within peoples. It is not within limits of possibility to cause disharmony in any way. Approximations of positive statements, it is a plain of a type of bipedal vehicle which is much denser and more full of life. It is a plane wherein one is aware of the thoughts of other selves. It is a plane where one is aware of the vibrations of other selves. It is a plane of compassion and understanding of the sorrows of third density. It is a plane striving towards wisdom or light. It is a plane wherein individual differences are pronounced, although automatically harmonized by group consensus. So we're on the precipice right now of becoming fourth density beings. What we have to do is consciously take the next step or the next several steps of trying to raise our consciousness, becoming more service to others so that we will, we will be diverted to a more positive timeline to where some of the things we're gonna speak about tonight, if um, we're on the positive timeline, we won't even have to worry about witnessing. One other thing about this slide is that even though right now it looks like we're a long ways away from uh, not causing disharmony in any way, there is a transition period that they describe as a law of one. So even though there might be a harvest event, there is a transition, and it, and it could be a while before all the consciousness remnants of third density finally transition fully to fourth density. Why are we transitioning densities right now? What is so special about this time? There okay, so why are we transitioning? Let's see, this was a question... Um, Don saying, the way I understand the process of evolution is that population has a certain amount of time to progress. Uh, this is generally divided in 25,000 year cycles. Uh, this is what uh, uh, Ra had explained previously. Uh, there's uh, three groups of, uh, uh, there's 25,000 year cycles and then three of them put together in a 75,000 year major cycle. Um, so Don is asking what caused this situation to come about? Um, what set this up to begin with? And Ra says, Visualize, if you will, the particular energy which <laughs> outward flowing and inward coagulating formed the tiny realm of the creation governed by your council of Saturn. Continue seeing the rhythm of this process. The living flow creates a rhythm which is as inevitable as one of your timepieces. Each of your planetary entities began the first cycle when the energy nexus was able in that environment to support such mind-body experiences. Thus, each of your planetary entities 
is on a different cyclical schedule, as you might call it. The timing of these cycles is a measurement equal to a portion of intelligent energy. The intelligent energy offers a type of clock. The cycles move as precisely as a clock strikes your hour. Thus, the gateway from intelligent energy to intelligent infinity opens regardless of the circumstance on the striking of the hour. Now, what's interesting is recently Tier Air communicated to me that, that they have been buffering these energies from us for a while, that it, they've had spheres that have been present since the 30s, but they came in earnest around the end of 2011. We were, as a collective, we have been so far away from where we needed to be to be able to handle these inner cosmic energies that they had to buffer the energies or we just would have destroyed ourselves. Now, what is occurring right now is that these spheres are becoming almost non-existent. They're barely buffering any energy at all now. And Tierer said recently that these spheres are about to completely disappear from our reality. And we will, um, I guess that means we are deemed acclimated enough to um, deal with the full onset of these energies. And he further described to me, and I hadn't heard about a larger cataclysm that occurred a long time ago, but apparently there was a huge stellar cataclysm, multiple stellar cataclysm that occurred in the sector of the galaxy that we're in. It was uh, a very large cataclysm that happened uh, early in the, uh, in the development or the formation of the galaxy, and that we have been in that zone for thousands of years, and we're about to come out of that zone into an area to where the cosmic radiation in the form of gases and the form of um, actual like photons will have will be moving into the full brunt of those energies, and it it is those energies that are going to um, give us a consciousness boost, which was going to lead to this ascension. What are some changes we can expect in this transition. Corey and I spent a little time looking through different quotes, uh, and we thought this was a good one to share, because Carla basically asked a very similar question. How may I best revitalize myself, not only now, but in the future? And this, inf this information they gave, or these recommendations, were specific to Carla Ruckert, but I think for a lot of us, they apply. So they said, this instrument is aware, meaning Carla Ruckert, who's, the, who's channeling, that's why they call her the instrument, is aware of the basic, Carla is aware of the basic needs of its constitution, <laughs> her constitution, those being meditation, acceptance of limitations, experiences of joy through association with others, and joy with the beauty as of the singing, she frequently sang at her church, um, and the exercising, uh, actual physical exercise with great contact whenever possible, um, with the life forces of second density. Oh, they describe physical exercising separately. This is the idea of actually hanging out with nature when they say second density, uh, especially those of trees. This entity also needing to be aware of the moderate but steady intake of food, especially exercise being suggested at a fairly early portion of the day. This is physical exercise. For a fairly early portion of the day, and at a later portion of the day before the resting. So they say two periods of physical exercise in the day, hang out with nature, be careful what you eat, and do what makes you happy. Basically sounds like maintaining a balance with your mind-body-spirit complex. You know, the Blue Avians delivered the message about a high vibratory diet, which most of us have been on here recently. And... Um, it's very important to think of your body. A lot of us are thinking about evolving out of a body or getting away from a body, but for right now, we have to maintain the body. And if we maintain it in a high vibratory way, it's gonna be a good vehicle for a high vibratory consciousness. Now, of course, it also basically directs you to do the inward work, to forgive yourself, to forgive others, and to, um, I guess, to stop the wheel of karma, which has been running over most of us, most of our lives. So I've been trying to do most of these things, but recently 
I realized on the trip that there was one thing that I had left out of all of these, and it had to do, uh, especially if those are the trees. <laughs> That was in Yosemite. What types of physical changes may occur during this transition? Uh, the question was um, about the period of the increase in vibration, which represents the, the transition period. And uh, Ra says that the first harbingers of this were approximately 45 years ago. The energy is vibrating more intensely through the 40-year period preceding the final movement of vibratory matter through the quantum leap, which represented the time after 1980. So they're saying it began 45 years before uh, 1980, uh, when, 1981 when this was channeled, and it, it, it increasing in the 40-year period preceding basically when we're at now, um, and, and up, up into what they're calling a quantum leap, as you would call it. 19, that would put it at about 1940, and the information I received from Tierra was around 1930 that it started, so it, that coincides pretty well. Okay, back on. Uh, the question, oh, let's see, this is a separate one. Um, Don was asking, did the ending of the first major cycle have something to do with the destruction of Lemuria? So basically, people have heard of Lemuria generally as this other continent uh, off the west coast. And they're saying, um, did this destruction just happen to occur at the end of the cycle, or was there some other reason? And Ross says, that at the end of a cycle, there is a confluence of energies. This encouraged what was already an inevitable adjustment in the movement of the surfaces of your planetary sphere. So they're saying the continents moved around at the, at the end of the cycle. Thank you. Now... In the first section here, the vibratory, vibratory matter shall go through a quantum leap. I believe the first quantum leap that's going to occur is a leap of consciousness. And as that occurs, and as we learn to wield that new control over our consciousness, we're going to have more and more control over matter. Now, now I was told also recently by Thierry that there are going, there are going, uh, as a part of these cosmic changes in the final shifting that the earth is doing into fourth density, that there are going to be what we would consider cataclysms. From our perspective, things that are not good, you know, uh, tsunamis, earthquakes, rising and lowering of continents. But TR said that it was very important that while we witness these things, that we do not feed it fear. Because these are basically just transitional birth pains, and we're having to go through it along with Gaia. If we feed it fear, then we're going to, it's gonna cause our co-creative consciousness to guide us into a less than optimal temporal reality. So it's, it, when we start seeing these types of things, we need to really begin to meditate on a positive outcome because that's, we're going to be very catalyzed during that time period. And of course, there is the chance that uh, the way this Mandela effect is playing into the whole process, that we could bifurcate into another timeline, and those of us who are doing the work will not experience any of, any of the negative stuff. I guess uh, a lot of us are wondering what can we do to help each other transition through this. Um, I, I believe a lot of us know certain individuals, even though we don't want to judge, that we look at and we're just like, they're, they're just not going to make it this cycle. <laughs> and uh, we're, we're seeing a lot of that. You know, we, we see these energies are causing a lot of uh, light workers to become more blissed out and kind of detached from reality. And we're having more of the, the negative types of people who are becoming more so. And they're focusing on all of the, uh, well, the negativity. And that's, that's all that they know how to recycle. 
Okay, so this was a rather uh, long answer here, and I could start out with the first paragraph, if that makes sense. The, the gist of this, the question was, is it possible to help an entity reach fourth density level in these last days? And Ross says, it is impossible to help another being directly. It is only possible to make catalyst available in whatever form. Uh, and that can mean a lot of things, but they say the most important form being the radiation of realization of oneness with the creator from the self. Less important being information such as we share with you. So they're saying it's more important to radiate, in some sense, love and light of the creator rather than simply try to teach. And that may involve putting ourselves in uncomfortable situations to be a, a tool or a catalyst. A lot of times we will be a catalyst through uh, an example or just um, a mission that we have in a, in a person's life, whether it be a long mission or a very brief one. Um, they say, we ourselves do not feel an urgency for this information to be widely disseminated. It is enough that we have made it available to three, four, or five. This is extremely ample reward, for if just one of these obtains fourth density understanding due to the catalyst, then we have fulfilled the law of one in the distortion of service. We encourage a dispassionate attempt to share information without concern for numbers or quick growth among others. That you attempt to make this information available is, in your term, your service. The attempt, if it reaches one, reaches all. We cannot offer shortcuts to enlightenment. Enlightenment is of the moment, is an opening to intelligent infinity. It can only be accomplished by the self for the self. Another self cannot teach enlightenment, but only teach information, inspiration, or a sharing of love, of mystery, of the unknown that makes the other self reach out and begin the seeking process that ends in a moment. But who can know when an entity will open the gate to the present? So being service to others is not an easy thing. A lot of times we're going to be drawn in to be a catalyst in the lives of those that uh, we would like to drag kicking and screaming in, into understanding what is going on here with this consciousness shift. There are no shortcuts to enlightenment. We all have to, to go through our, our karmic process. And the last couple of years, Kari stated that what they have put me through was a karmic quick burn. And uh, it's a very painful process, but one that I, th it's a process that I think many of us are being forced to go through. Many of us are seeing a lot of things that we've tried to bury popping back up quite a bit in life. So what types of examples do we have of what four fourth density living is like? Well, the Anshar, they're a fourth density species. Actually, most recently, they disclose that they are us from the future. They are us after we ascend, after we build quite a long history in that ascension. They had detected what was similar to um, the Mandela effect, and they traced it back, and they traced it back to our time period, and then they traced an earlier linchpin type event that happened 17 million years ago, or nearly 17 million years ago. They sent a very small group of their people back to that time period to maintain the timeline and to make sure that their reality uh, was not, uh, did, did not disappear. Now what occurred is 17 million years ago when this small group moved back in time, they began a society, and that society grew and grew until there, there, are, there are millions of them. They, they maintain their numbers, but they, they're in the millions. And they are living a fourth density existence below our feet. And they are trying to coach us and help us reach where we need to be because we are them in the past. Who is Kari? Well, most recently we discussed that her, she comes from the house of Ka. Her, she has me refer to her as Ari. And I kept that quiet for quite a period because she insists that you call her Ari. And people will come to me and, and tell me they had a special message for me or, or this or that. I, I wanted to know, you know, I have a way of knowing that, uh, you know, they were actually in contact. 
She said that at a very young age, she chose to be set aside from the rest of her fourth density um, group. She was set aside to be a priestess, set aside to be holy. When I did the mind meld with her, I immediately realized that she was over 130 years old. And I mean, she looked like she was in her mid 20s. She will basically teleport me down to their, their location in the central South America area where, where they are underground. But most, what she does most of the time is she teleports me to an area that I guess David uh, Wilcock coined the construct, kind of like the Matrix. And it's pretty similar. It's an area that we are co-creating together. We are co-creating that experience together. And um, we can do all kinds of interesting things in exchanging information in that environment. As I stated, the Anshar claim to be our future fourth density selves. Not only are they, but several of the other groups that represent the different uh, races of Earth. They are, most, most of them are from the future and they've come back to maintain timelines as well. How do the Anshar live a 4D existence while, uh, while we're living on Earth that is transitional right now? Well, they have a series of massive caverns. The main one, which is the one I saw, was about the size of uh, Texas, is how it was related to me. And th there weren't as many pillars as in this depiction here, but there were massive pillars, just miles and miles around, that came up from the floor and went all the way up to the ceiling, parts of the ceiling. And there was a fine mist up in all of the different um, uh, crevices in the ceiling of this cavern. And it was, they, were, they were kind of like clouds, but not, they weren't holding together like clouds. It was more like a mist. And in the pillars, they had, um, like, I guess, like condos built in all the way up and down. This is a, a representation. We're going to make it more accurate than this, but this is one that uh, I believe, Renee, you put this together? Yeah, Renee, Renee did this. Yes. <clears throat> when, when Kari showed me the city, when we walked out of this cave door entrance and we came around and I saw how big this cavern was and how huge the city was. It was, well, it was a city, but it was, they were kind of in clusters. There were various types of craft flying around. There were eggs, egg-shaped, cigar, and saucer-shaped. Now, one of the things I realized after being on a few of their craft was that these craft are powered and controlled by the consciousness of those flying it, the fourth density people flying it. it uh, um, it's, it's something I don't know if we would ever be able to fly their vessels. There were a lot of domes that seemed to be lit from the inside, or the skin of the dome was lit. And it, they looked like the size of stadiums, though I, I did not get an explanation of what they were. And then there were areas in the sides of the, ca the cavern that looked like they had just dematerialized to make um, buildings, ledges, balconies. And the stone that was removed somehow was, um, they created these buildings made of the rock. It was almost like they liquefied the rock and, and put it in a mold. And uh, there were, I mean, there were no bricks, there were no seams, and the, these were very tall buildings that had uh, glass, what looked like glass windows. I guess, has just about everyone heard about the mind meld with Kari? Okay. When I, I was having our third density, or 
transitional consciousnesses have, it's, it's impossible for us to understand some of the concepts that um, these higher density beings um, pass on to us. A lot of times, I literally, they'll try to pass on a concept to me, I will spend two or three days not speaking to hardly anyone, staring at the wall, trying to contemplate it and figure it out and figure out how to mold it into to my way of thinking. What has helped that was that Kari wanted to do what uh, basically is a mind meld, a Vulcan mind meld. She first asked me if I wanted to have a drink while we were, in my first visit down in the um, um, area where all of the uh, priest, priests and priestesses um, um, reside. They're complete, they don't reside in the cities. She turned around and had a glass of this thick amber liquid and she asked me if I would drink it and I asked her what it was and she called it the, uh, the uh, elixir of Isis and I asked her what it was made from and she said it was made from a rare flower that grew down in un underground. I refused to take it. I, this was my first visit. I was still kind of testing the spirits, as I say. She drank some of it, and immediately she seemed more relaxed, more, her, her demeanor changed. Now, when she leaned down in front of me, and on both of her knees, she put her wrists like this, and her hands up, and motioned for me to come in and do the same. And I did, and when our hands joined, I felt, it's kind of like being pulled out of a soggy, cold wetsuit, you know, out of my meat suit. I was pulled out, and in between her and I, we were joint, we were together. There, I had no real perception of myself, or I couldn't tell where she ended and, and I began. And immediately, she was very advanced uh, psychically. She immediately took over and started um, taking me through somewhat of a life review. And she was gaining information from that review. But as she was doing so, I was able to see little bits and pieces of, of her life growing up. But I was not able or prepared to at the time, I did not know what was about to happen, to hone in and look at those deeper. She was able to access all of my information and download it to a point where she has access at all times. And it was such a, a profound emotional experience and a bonding experience between her and I. She said that because of that experience, no matter what happens on the surface of the earth, she would be looking in on me for the rest of my life. She would have no choice. We had sort of, um, you know, become one. Thanks. So how do the Anshar eat? How do they live? Do you eat when you're fourth density? Well, apparently, at least for a while, you do. They have long since moved away from uh, consuming animals, that they did that before their transition. So what they do is they have these um, huge uh, gardens that, are, that they use to raise fruits and vegetables. When she took me to the gardens and we walked up to the ledge, I, I was surprised. As I was walking closer and closer to the ledge, I experienced a very similar feeling at the Grand Canyon. As you know, you walk up to the edge and everything opens up below you. As I walked up over the, over the ledge, I could see all the different crops that they had. And she told me that the substrate that they grow in are a high vibratory certain type of rock and crushed crystals. And that uh, they go through a process of re-energizing the crystals every once in a while uh, as they are recycling everything. everything. Everything is recycled. And there was the light that was provided for these plants was done, believe it or not, from sound. They created a sound wave that produced light. So there were, there were no light fixtures anywhere. And there were no shadows. 
the light was uniform. Now, apparently they also preserved animals that we've been assuming were from the past because they were just so different looking. But I wonder now if these are animals that they brought from the future, from, from their timeline. They're very, they were very prehistoric looking and um, more than likely this became sort of, sort of a nature reserve to where they would pull species that were becoming extinct over a long period of time. In the very middle of this area was um, a large plasma ball that looked like it was basically mimicking the sun. It was floating uh, in between the ceiling and the tip of an obelisk that looked very weathered, very old. Pieces of it were chipped away. Uh, it looked like water erosion um, had occurred as well. And there were uh, thicker misty clouds up at the top of the cave. And it, it was kind of like a misty rain that, that would come down. Now, what was weird is when I explained this to David Wilcock when we were preparing to shoot Cosmic Disclosure, his eyes got quarter-sized, and he went and he got, grabbed his new book cover out of his bag. And uh, we looked at the, at the book cover, and if you see, there's a, like a star at the tip of... Um, of it, it, yeah, of it. and then there's uh, Saturn in the background, which a weird thing. If uh, you remember in the, the first slide about the Anshar, they had a uh, pendant that was Saturn, and they had a jewel in uh, different positions inside the pendant to depict what group they were uh, and where they where they were based on the Earth. But uh, yeah, David was really taken back when I described this right after he had just received his, his new book cover design. Now, I was brought to the library area. And in the library, not only when we, when we walked through the library, we started off, we saw scrolls and tablets, uh, it moved into bound books. And then it looked like I mean, completely modern books with ISBN numbers, like they had ordered it off of Amazon.com. I don't know how they received the delivery, but but they had some of some very new some very new books that they were they were keep, keeping for uh, reference. On the bottom layer, I was taken to this huge chamber. It looked like a pressurized chamber, and in it, at the bottom, was laying one of the crystals that was very similar to a crystal I had seen when I was around 10 years old when I was being trained in the programs and they brought my class down to a crystal cavern to have us interface with basically like do a mind meld with the crystals. And afterwards we were, we were successful. We connected with the crystals and downloaded some information but then we were taken, the information was removed from us, and then we were blank slated. So we were basically used like a USB drive to get the information from the, the, the crystals. Now also, when I was in the mind meld with Kari, I saw an incident to where a young child that she was friends with had been killed by a raptor. And raptors are like these saurian bird type mixes that are um, they're holdouts from the dinosaur era. And these beings had taken over one of these major crystal caverns that they wanted access, that the Anshar wanted access to. They, it, it, there were repositories of information, and the, uh, the Anshar had not had access in quite some time to this crystal cavern. But they did have a crystal from the cavern that was taken over, and it apparently they were trying to grow it in this chamber. How are the Anshar assisting us? in this transition right now. Well, they've made it clear that they're no longer going to abide by the Mohammed Accords. They're the negative groups that they were supposed to get together with to um, end these accords would not, would not meet with them. So four different groups decided that on their own they were going to begin the process of making contact with humanity and assisting us. And they had to do this within the realms of cosmic law. To do so, they first are going to start communicating with us when we're in states of meditation 
or sleep. And they're, they're gonna, they plan on doing quite a bit of work on us when we're in those states until they get us acclimated to a point to where we are ready for one-on-one -on -one contact with them, them entering our homes and, and ha having conversations with us. And they said that this would begin to occur with individuals as well as, you know, one, two, three people. It will not be, they will not appear on television. It, they're going to appear to people that are ready, that have been doing the work to help become a catalyst for this consciousness renaissance that we need to kick into. And the Anshar, along with the other groups, have been very worried lately because it does not seem as though we are headed towards the most optimal temporal reality or the one or the reality in which they come from. So they're, they're getting a little bit desperate and they're really needing all of us to kick in and uh, kick in our co-creative consciousness um, and they're willing to, to back us up. Yeah. So on Monday, when all of us are getting into that special place and beginning our meditation to, to try to, to bring a mo the most optimal temporal reality, we're not the only ones vested in that temporal reality. Our future selves are also vested in it, and they are going to lend their extremely uh, powerful co-creative consciousnesses to uh, the, the same mission that, that we're lending ours to. 4D living in the cosmos. Who is Ambassador Mika? Ambassador Mika was introduced to me basically by Gonzalez in the presence of Tier Air. Mika's people come from one of the closest stars to ours in our local star cluster. Their planet is made up mostly of islands, uh, desert islands and tropical islands. And their people recently went through what we are about to go through. They went through a whole process of shaking off the control system. They also had to deal with these reptilian forces as well as these different genetic farmer groups that were, um, I guess, there was a battle between the negative and the positive groups to have them choose a less than optimal temporal reality. They were able to get past those challenges. They say that their challenges were nowhere near as significant as ours, but they are achievable and they are as well are reaching out to us in, when, in meditative states and in dream states to try to impart information on, into us, into our, to, to cause a hundredth monkey effect, to give us different methods that they found useful for breaking the control system and uh, entering into this consciousness renaissance. Well, as I stated, Mika's people went through a very similar process, even though the one that we have to go through is uh, much more significant. Our location close to the super gate in our local star cluster. We're right in the middle of our local star cluster and just outside of our solar system is what they call a super gate that can be used to traverse multiple galaxies and anywhere within our galaxy. It's a very, very coveted gate system, but at the same time it made us major targets for these 22 different genetic um, farmer groups because it gave them access to us. And because we're closest to the gate, that's why we have so much genetic diversity as well. Even the animal kingdom, um, they have brought in different genetics and different animals to relocate them here over time. And um, they've done the same with the human stock with the, with, this, with the 22 genetic experiments. So what is a consciousness renaissance? Not too terribly long ago, we came out of some dark ages and uh, began a renaissance of our own. And it was a consciousness renaissance. It was, you know, of, of the arts mainly. Well, that is nothing compared to what's in store for us next. Once we have these different energetic pulses occur, those are going to be a catalyst for our consciousness to expand very rapidly. We're going to go from basically a, a, a point of ignorance to a point of having full access 
our almost full access to our higher selves and to our co-creative consciousness. And um, as, as we make that transition, we learn to wield that co-creative consciousness over years. It's not going to be like that. We're, the process will be a renaissance. We're, we're, we're going to go from having a different perspective on the world to realizing that we can change the world with uh, consensus. So how are Mecca's people supporting us here on Earth? Well, not only are they reaching out to us as Kari's people are, but they are preparing. They're preparing to come and walk and work among us once we shake off this control system. They see us as their cosmic cousins and they're ready for a family reunion, but we have to be ready. And when we're ready, we are gonna have a number of different human looking beings coming here, introducing themselves. We'll find out genetically they're very little, there's very little difference and, they, and we will greet these family members and they're gonna help us out of a very hard time. The 22 genetics experiments are experiments in ascension the different, different aspects of ascension. From a cosmic perspective, our local star cluster has been hosting these 22 genetic programs. Outside of our star cluster, there are other programs going on, but these, different, these genetic farmer beings did not have access to our local star cluster for quite a while until there was a war that dropped the defenses that were around our, our star cluster. There was uh, the ancient builder race, a race that has disappeared, developed a defense grid around our local star cluster. And once that was brought down, all of the genetic farmer races rushed in because there were genetics that had been developing for you know, eons that they had not had access to. The only genetic experiments that were going on within the local star cluster were beings inside that local star cluster that were beginning to, to experiment with genetic engineering um, and um, you know, making changes to planets to make them inhabitable, terraforming. What are the different components of this program? Of course, there's a genetic program where they're taking genetic stock from themselves and from different star systems and mixing them with ours in a way that is going to make us better, it makes us a better vehicle for the higher consciousness they're trying to impart onto us. Now consciousness is another component. They are trying to give us, you know, different belief systems. They've brought us many different belief systems over the eons. And these belief systems were not always to control us, but they were also to uh, cause us to slowly expand our consciousness and, and have a more spiritual understanding of things. Now, the spiritual component and the consciousness component are obviously related. The one that has not been talked about that much is the cosmic component, this giant clockwork that's occurring. As we're passing through this giant clock, while we're making this journey, these 22 genetic farmer races are busy working on our genetics and our consciousness and spirituality to make us ready. If, if they did not do this work, as we went through the, these cycles, we would go through them much slower because we would not, they're giving us um, a major boost in, um, in, in genetics and um, they're, they're working in concert with the cosmic component. So what happens when ET participants of the experiment incarnate on Earth? Well, these beings, they have to work within cosmic law. In order for some of them to be able to come here and do experiments on us, they will take a part of their non-terrestrial group and have them incarnate as human beings. And in doing so, giving permission for them to be um, abducted or experimented on or any number of other things. But because of cosmic law, they have to have their memories wiped when they come in. It's, it's just a part of the cosmic law. 
we've had ETs die on Earth, and depending on where they are in, in their development, if they're a fourth or a fifth density being, especially a fourth, they can get caught up in our incarnation cycle. As a matter of fact, in the, in the uh, inter, uh, Intruder Intercepted Interrogation Program, our perspective was that there was this ET group that, that was coming in, abducting people at night, and then returning them dead. And, you know, how evil is that, right? That's horrible. They're killing people. Let's figure out what's going on. Let's, uh, you know, let's intercept one of these vessels and uh, interrogate them. Well, we did. And guess what we found out? They were there on a rescue mission from their perspective. Thousands of years earlier, one of their craft had crashed, and many of their inhabitants had gotten caught up in our incarnation cycle. And what they perceived they were doing is locating long-lost comrades and rescuing them from this horrible third-density life and putting them back into a, a body that they had been in before. So from our perspective, it looked like a very evil, heinous thing that they were doing. But from their perspective, they were rescuing long-lost comrades. What is the natural law loophole? Well, as I stated, they incarnate here to prevent uh, violating any type of cosmic law. Now, not all wanderers or starseeds are coming here to be guinea pigs. Most of us have a soul contract, and uh, I think I was talking with Teresa recently, uh, when I check out of this existence, I'm going to want to see the paperwork. I want to see a signature because I don't know why I would have agreed to this. This is crazy. <laughs> but supposedly, we agreed to this. I don't know. It could be a psyop, but supposedly we agreed to it. Yeah, I recovered it. So how do they contain the experiment? If they have all these different experiments and all these different experiments, mice, lab mice roaming the earth, how do they keep these um, uh, gene pools pure? How do you keep them from interbreeding together unless you want them to? Well, within religions and social norms, you have them program themselves. You create um, beautiful things like racism. You instill hate and fear of what is different than you so that you will either attack it or flee from it. You, they have different languages to keep you separated from each other consciousness, conscious-wise, as well as they'll separate you from different geological locations. And what they want to do, what they've mainly done is they programmed us to, I mean, how many of you were younger, you had a parent say, uh, you know, you, you can't marry outside of your race. You, you know, those are, are, that is us maintaining ourselves. We were programmed to maintain ourselves. And uh, we're starting to start to, we're starting to break a lot of those programs as a society slowly but surely. Now, these programs are working in concert with each other for the overall goal, but they're also competing with each other. They want to see their genetic line, they want to see their program be the, the one that comes out on top. Now, a lot of them, it's, it's, not an ego, it's not an ego thing for them because they are tied to us karmically until they are invested in this program. They have to help us develop physically through genetics our, and consciousness, help our consciousness expand so that when this cosmic component occurs, we are ready to ascend or expand in our consciousness, which will allow them to take the next step. But because they um, have karmic entanglement with us, they can, they can no longer ascend. They are tied to us in, in our process. So how does this, this program develop over time? Well, at first, of course, they're going to be tinkering with our genetics in the background, sending uh, angels down to walk amongst us and give us different ideas about religion or uh, different tools for civilization. 
But when we get to the point where we're starting to get now to where we are maintaining, we, we're beginning to maintain genetics ourselves. We're learning, we're breaking the genetic codes before long, we are going to self-manage. Every civilization out there reaches that point to where they don't have to be tinkered with anymore. They become, I guess, mature, and they begin to tend their own gardens. And that's where we're about to be. The Anshar and the other different, the different groups, they can manipulate their DNA, their, their energetic fields, and that, that's something that we are we're all headed towards as well as becoming a cosmic species, which uh, overtly becoming a cosmic species. Right now, we have a presence in the cosmos that is not exactly a positive one, but that too will change. Now, these upgrades that they give us from time to time are, they're meant to coincide with this cosmic energy that is increasing. Every time we get to a point in the cycle to where we're about to have these um, cosmic energies increase, they begin um, tinkering with our genetics and giving us um, ideologies that will help our consciousness um, expand. So what's the recipe for success? How do we, how do we, how do we achieve a perfect balance right now? I mean, all of us are on that path, that's what we want, but we're in this environment that is so hectic, you know, how, how do we ground? I think doing what we're doing now, finding tribe or birds of a feather, if you will, this is one of the ways that we're, we're really gonna be able to ground ourselves. It's through supporting each other that we're gonna be able to, you know, you know, take this horrible density for as long as we have to until we get our, this mission completed. In, in order to, trans, uh, to transition, we also have to start working on the co-creative consciousness, planting seeds, using our skills. There are a lot of very creative people here now, and the creativity that you have access to has a major impact on the co-creative consciousness. Each of you, through making videos, art, music, have a way to contribute to this 100th monkey effect to where you can cause people to get on the same page. Just like Ross said earlier, delivering the information to two, three, four people was all it took because that seed was planted in this mass consciousness and we've seen how it has grown since then. Uh, what are the effects of incarnating on Earth now? Well, there's apparently some sort of a solar sneeze coming. It's very difficult to predict what exactly it's going to be like. We have people, the more nuts and bolts people, that think it's just going to be a major uh, coronal mass ejection that is going to take out of electronics either for a little while or permanently. And uh, it's, you know, it's just going to be an inconvenience. Some of them think that it's going to be a kill shot. Everyone's going to be burned up on the earth. Well, they're on both sides, the positive and the negative, there are the more esoteric or spiritual types that believe that this is going to be some sort of an ascension or a shift. But um, there's very little consensus among us or within the programs. We, it's, it's still, it's, it's a mystery. Now, what, is, what has been communicated by Tier Air is that this upgrade will provide more than 100,000 years of evolution in less than 1,000 years. Our society in 1,000 years will make this huge quantum leap. Now, the population has never been larger. It seems that every soul that has ever existed is incarnated right now. And I think that the number of, the number of wanderers that have incarnated here since the 80s has, it, it has become a, a significant part of the population in my opinion. So how do we go from star seeds to star blossoms? That's a term Bridget Nielsen recently coined. It was really, 
is really apt. Um, many ET groups are, ascend are incarnating here to help us in the ascension process. The more, some of the negative groups are more overtly interfering with us through secret societies, through direct contact with those in the government. The more benevolent ones are going to do so through cosmic law, and they're doing so through incarnating here as well as communicating with us telepathically. And what's occurring is that all of the star seeds that I'm running into are they're transitioning into star blossoms. They're all of a sudden, they knew they were different, they knew they had a mission, but now they're finding the mission. They're fine tuning the missions. And everyone that I've seen here talking about their mission, their, their mission has done so with an extreme amount of excitement. Everyone that is here to do a mission is ready to do that mission right now. And that's why we're coming together like this. We're coming together to organize for that mission. So, we're in an evolving experiment. We've, we've always been in it, and the goal of this experiment is ascension. Now, a part of the ascension process and what will lead us to this consciousness renaissance is full disclosure. Now, we are all begging for full disclosure. Hopefully, in the near future, we'll all be marching and demanding full disclosure. But of all the people on earth, we need to realize that it's not going to be a kumbaya moment. Full disclosure is going to be the release of not only the secrets, but the crimes against humanity that were perpetrated to keep the secrets. The, uh, the things that I've talked about on cosmic disclosure, the galactic slave trade, all of these things are going to be a major shock and trauma to us. Disclosure is going to be traumatic, but all evolution occurs during stress. All evolution. So when, when we have full disclosure and, and we do have the trauma that we're going to try to work through, we need to realize that that trauma is actually a gift that's going to help us evolve. An opportunity to navigate the most temporal optimal, or the most optimal timeline. I was, as y'all have heard, I, w I heard in the last six months, it's been a little bit longer now, that um, we have a small window of opportunity to be able to a attain the most optimal temporal reality. And what has to occur is that all of us have to contribute. We all have to, we contribute through our skills, we contribute on every level that we can, including mass meditations, which is what we're about to do. But uh, it's, it's really important that we find ways to plant seeds in the mass consciousness over the, over the next three years, because that looks like it's going to be the catalyst that, well, us as a mass consciousness, or we're going to decide which timeline we're going, we're, we're going to experience. And um, we have a lot of negative groups that are trying to guide us to the wrong temporal reality. And we have a huge responsibility right now. I'm gonna, Mike, do you want to talk about the Full Disclosure Project? Meet Mike recently organized a, um, I, I guess it was a protest, or kind of, not really a protest, outside of an Air Force base where they were handing out um, flyers to, to these people walking inside the Air Force base. And I had no idea this was going on. Sigmund, not too long ago, told me, well, I won't use their language, but to have my people quit harassing his people at an Air Force base, and I denied having any knowledge of it, and he kind of scowled at me like I was a liar. And then I find out months later that uh, someone on my team had been doing it. It was Mike. <laughs> which, which blows me away. Yeah. Mike, he's this very quiet guy, very humble guy, okay? And then he's out handing flyers to Air Force personnel going on the base. I mean, that, I, I've had a problem rec reconciling that in the beginning. He's, he's got a lot of guts. It's because of my friend over here, Lotus, has been doing it his whole... Not, where is he? Where is Lotus? Yeah. Right there. He's been doing it his whole life, so he encouraged me to do it. 
But this is something that's really worth emphasizing because all I did was start a meetup group and Lotus, people like Lotus showed up and pushed me to do things. Uh, people like Lotus showed up to my meetup group and that pushed me to be inspired to do things like the protest at Shriver Air Force Base and the Space Symposium in Colorado Springs. We did that a few times. We're not just giving out flyers, we're giving out DVDs and I'm getting better and better at making DVDs and uh, putting a lot onto one DVD. Um, so I actually created a few things uh, leading up to this that we can announce right now, I think. Yeah. How, how many of you are willing to take part in something like that in your community? I thought so. All right. Okay, so, well, the first thing we're probably going to do is, should we go out the flyer, you think? So we got a flyer here that uh, explains basically some of the simple steps of what you can do to start a group, similar to what I did. Um, and we're also working towards just creating a... Uh, a uh, 501c3 type organization around the Full Disclosure Project which can help support uh, local chapters of the Full Disclosure Project in some way. And so this flyer explains that a little bit and it gives a link at the top. The link at the very top is community.fulldisclosureproject.org which is where you can go right now to begin the discussions and following after this discussing uh, how you start a group and what's going on with the Full Disclosure Project. Right now, we really haven't had a, a resource like that, except for the Facebook pages. But this will be a much more structured. Um, it's not exactly a traditional forum. It's, it's software. It's called Discourse. It's a little bit more like a social network. Some of the better features, uh, it works better on mobile devices than a traditional forum. But it does for, allow for a structured discussion to occur uh, on many topics. We can do that. Um, I also created a website you'll see at the, the back of the flyer. Um, I couldn't decide if I should call it like Disclosure Institute, Disclosure Academy, just somewhere where I could put like flyers and DVDs for you to, to learn from and also distribute to others. So if you go to DisclosureInstitute.org right now, you can find uh, the flyers that we used for the Shriver protest and also you'll find a bunch of DVDs that I've given out. Uh, you find DVD images, uh, which are the, the things that you download and then burn onto a blank DVD. And so it's really cheap to buy DVDs right now, DVD Rs, DVD plus Rs, if you have a DVD burner. And then you can pass out tons of information, great information to people. And it works a little bit better sometimes than just giving people a link. If you have something that you can actually hand to them, it works a lot, a lot better. Yeah, they're passing out flyers uh, with more information on how you can participate. So as we're talking, they, they should... Thing, one thing I have to say is that the flyer that we're passing out, some people already got it if you got a packet recently in the last couple hours. If you got a packet, you don't need to get one of these flyers. It's already in the packet. Yeah, thanks, Mike. <laughs> now, we're really planning on getting organized here soon. We're planning on getting very organized. And we're going to... We're not going to do protests like the Soros types of protests that we've seen over the last couple of years. It's going to be more like peaceful walks. And uh, we're going to come up with different uh, clever ways of use, using uh, you know, the different types of press to, to release this information as well. So uh, definitely we would love to have everyone take part and contribute their skills. Yeah, we're looking very forward to this. One other thing I want to share is the email address you can now use to contact us is teams at fulldisclosureproject.org. Well, what do we do after disclosure? You've heard David Wilcock talk about, and we talked about it's not going to be a kumbaya moment. We're going to have people that are going to be so depressed they don't want to get out of bed, take a shower. It's going to be bad. We're going to go through that process too, but we're going to be more prepared. So not only are we going to have to assist our loved ones, but who's made a plan? Have the mental health professionals gotten together to uh, create a, a response plan for, for people, for not only the people who have mental issues, but for the regular person who has been taught a dogma or a religion all their life, and they find out now, and we're gonna find out too, that we were lied to or we were wrong. Well, actually, we now have professionals from all over the field, the field, the mental health field, coming together to do exactly that. Some mental health professionals that don't believe in aliens at all, but it's a good mental exercise for a lot of them. They're coming up 
with different plans to assist different personality types, people from different religious beliefs, uh, for, for all over the world. It's a, uh, I think it's one of the most important things that no one's ever thought of. You know, why, why hasn't this been done? Well, one of our team members, Vivian Davis, she has a, a master's degree in psychology. She's a therapist. She's taken this project to the next level, and she's going to run with it uh, with a few other people. And uh, they're going to do a workshop on, on Sunday, tomorrow morning. I'm going to be here. I hope you can all be here. Um, if you have a mental health, uh, a background in mental health, or know people in your family who would be interested in this, you know, please grab the information and uh, circulate this website to them, uh, disclosuresupport.org. So, um, anyway, this is a real important project that we're proud of, and we see it um, growing. It's growing very rapidly right now. Thank you. So, how can you contribute? I'm sure you all have your own little missions, your own little uh, pet projects, but we have a lot of different skills here. You don't have to be an artist. You don't have to be a musician. We have writers. We have uh, sound engineers, uh, researchers, people that have uh, experience with social media. Everyone can contribute. And right now, Gaia has a lot of positions open. Um, if you could... Uh, go to the website, look for a position that you would that would match, and uh, go ahead and apply. It would be um, uh, people. A lot of people have been uh, hooking up with Gaia and getting positions recently from um, like a contact in the desert, and they've uh, gotten a lot of really good people recently. So there's always a way for you to contribute. Yeah, and that's it. Yeah. Don't forget. Don't forget to don't forget to share cosmic um, co-creation.com with your friends. It's uh, a good program. Uh, Gerald Donald put it together. It, it's to help with remote learn remote viewing, remote influencing. But when I first started doing it, I started having all kinds of spontaneous out of body experiences and uh, very interesting other experiences. So um, this will help with the consciousness expansion in my opinion. Thank you, give it up for Corey.